Redeemer Queens Park exists to help connect Jesus to people, people to community, and community to mission. And our vision is a whole movement of people believing in Jesus, living in community, and starting new churches across London. Redeemer is a growing and diverse spiritual family. And let it be known at the outset of this that Redeemer Queens Park is not an event that you attend, but it's a people that you belong to, both an institution and an organism. Something that's clearly identified by rhythms, routines, and events, but a people living in a place. And we're in a collection of talks right now talking about Redeemer's distinct vision and values. And today I want to share with you Redeemer's number one core value, and it is simply this. Jesus changes everything. And here we are in Aldersgate Street in London, a very significant and important location for reasons I'll tell you about in just a few minutes' time. And here we are talking about Jesus. Not a concept, not an idea, the real and resurrected person the son of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who was sent into the world to heal the ultimate problem, the problem of our alienation and separation and our disconnection from a loving God and to restore God's good purposes in us so we can have wholeness and flourishing just as a loving God desired it for us. Let's think about it in just three simple steps. First, Jesus. Second, change. And third, everything. First, Jesus. Jesus is the most celebrated person who ever lived. From secular historians to theologians, there is wide agreement that Jesus Christ is the number one most significant life that was ever lived. Just to give a few references here, the Writer and historian H.G. Wells from right here in Great Britain once said, I'm a historian, I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that the penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. If you were to visit the Rockefeller Center in New York City, inscribed above the doors of that important building in that important city are these words. Man's ultimate destiny does not depend on whether he can learn new lessons or make new discoveries and conquests, but on the acceptance of the lesson taught him close upon 2,000 years ago. How about Napoleon Bonaparte, who once said, I know men and let me tell you, Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person who lived in the world, there is no possible term of comparison because Alexander, Caesar and Charlemagne and I have founded empires, but upon what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men died for him. Even Fidel Castro, the communist dictator and revolutionary in Cuba, once said, I have always considered Jesus Christ to be one of the greatest revolutionaries in the history of the world. This is the one right at the center of everything we say and do as the Redeemer community. Or, as said by Charles Spurgeon, who once preached the gospel and ministered not far from here, Christ is the central fact of world history. To him, everything looks forward and backward, and all the lines of history converge upon him. All the great purposes of God, they culminate in Him. Jesus, consider with me a brief biographical sketch of the most important man who ever lived. Jesus is the God-man who came to earth to deal with our sin and our brokenness and to restore our relationship with God. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. His mother's name was Mary. His father named Joseph adopted him and brought him in as a son. He was born in a barnyard stable. He was wrapped in, sa in, in scrap cloths and he was laid in a feeding trough. His birth announcement was unlike any of the birth announcements we send around today. Angels proclaimed his arrival in the countryside. His lineage is diverse. His family tree, to say the least, has a little bit of everything going on in it. 
There's Tamar, a person who bore two sons out of incest. There's Rahab, who is a prostitute from a hated nation. There's Bathsheba, who's a woman who committed adultery. And the significance of this lineage is to point us that Jesus is unashamed to identify with all sorts of people from all walks of life. Hebrews 2.11, he is not ashamed to call them family. Oh, he's the center of what we do. He was from a place called Nazareth, a nondescript Jewish agricultural village. He probably knew only fewer than 400 people in the town he was from, and it was the kind of place that people would snark at. Can anything good come from Nazareth? His childhood was probably exceedingly simple. He was, he was presented in the temple, and he was treated as just one of the common people. And his adult life for the first 30 years was spent working for his father Joseph as an apprentice in his carpentry business. He probably never traveled more than a few hundred miles from home. He never wrote a book. He didn't make much money. And he is not really well known until he was 30 years old when he started his ministry. He was baptized and he was tempted. He understood himself to be the leader of a new kingdom. And he invited people to join him in the establishment of his new world order. Jesus' ministry was astounding. Jesus performed miracles. Jesus fed the poor. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus raised the dead. Everywhere he went, he never left the place the same because Jesus changes everything. He chose 12 incredibly unlikely men to be his disciples. And outside of that, there were many other men and women who followed him around. Different political persuasions, different theological backgrounds, different cultural concerns, and yet they all had one thing in common. They belonged to this man who had come into their life and he had changed their story and he made them a family. These 12 were fascinating to behold. And Jesus had a central mission statement that he lived his life by. From his hometown in Nazareth, he once walked into the temple one day and rolls open a scroll. And he read this verse. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom of the prisoner and recovery of the sight for the blind and to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then... He rolls up the scroll, hands it to the attendant. He looks at everybody and he says, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Talk about a mic drop moment. Oh, he changes everything. Jesus said the most incredible statements. He once said that he was sent by the Father in heaven. He believed that the Bible was written all about him. He believed himself to be the fulfillment of all the biblical themes of prophet and priest and king and, king and temple and land. He embodied the teaching of Israel. He taught on, sick, on, on sin. He taught on sin. He taught on sex. He taught on worry. He taught on grief. He taught on anxiety. And he taught on the kingdom of God. He did the most incredible works. He rebuked sickness and he healed people. He turned water into wine. He once raised a nobleman's son from the dead. He healed a crippled man. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children. And he once healed a man who was blind from birth. He raised his good friend Lazarus from the dead. There is no one like him. Jesus' ethic is unlike anything else. He once called his followers to do incredible things throughout the world. He fed the hungry and he gave drinks to the thirsty. He welcomed the stranger. He clothed the naked. He, he loved on the prisoner. He cared for the sick. He befriended sinners. His kingdom was an upside-down kingdom. The people you would never expect, so they got in on it with this one. He got along with all sorts of people, but he saved confrontation for a select few the religious, and the pious. He was not trying to convert or persuade the Jewish establishment. In fact, he took issue with those who thought they could justify themselves on their own good behavior and good works. He cared for children. In a time when the life expectancy might have been around just eight years old, Jesus welcomed children. Children sang to Jesus and welcomed him. And everywhere that Christianity has spread throughout the world, adoption has spread with it. Because Jesus, he changes our hearts in such a way where families and cultures are changed as well. Jesus cared for women. 
In the days of Jesus, women were treated as the property of their husbands. They were mistreated and abused, oftentimes with no legal recourse. And Jesus is the original and Jesus is the ultimate freedom fighter for women. On one occasion, Jesus rose to the defense of a woman who was clearly caught in the act of adultery. He became her attorney and saved her life, and he was not ashamed by it. Jesus ripped down all the social conditions pitted against women. And wherever Christianity has spread throughout the world, the dignity and worth of women has spread with it. Because Jesus changes everything. Jesus challenged people to think. Education was not considered necessary for people during Jesus' day, but Jesus himself was a rabbi and a teacher who got along with everyone. He was a master teacher and linguist. He was human. He had an imagination. He thought of stories and he told them to his friends. He knew all the other emotions, but he never sinned in them. He never got angry, let alone violent. He never got impatient or frustrated. He knew sorrow and joy in its purest forms. He was blunt and strong with his words without any underlying sinful emotion that could ever throw him off. He expressed anger, he wept, and he rejoiced. He knew sorrow, he was passionate, and he knew what it was to be quiet. And he preached a childlike, friendly faith. Jesus was criticized for many things. He was accused of being a glutton and a drunk. People couldn't stand him for the people he hung around because he chose to hung out with the least of these. Oh, the people that the rest of the world just looked at and said, they're clearly undeserving. Oh, these are the very few that Jesus decided to bring to himself. And Jesus prepared to die by praying. He goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays drops of sweat from his brow through the night. Father, if you could, please let this cup pass for you. But the Bible tells us, for the joy that was set before him, he went and he endured the cross. Jesus died on a cross, an old Roman cross. And the significance of that, which I'll explain to you in a few minutes, is only eclipsed by his glorious resurrection from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead after three days, vindicating everything that he ever said and everything that he ever did. He revealed himself to the people who followed him closely and knew him best. Then he revealed himself to over 500 people over the course of 40 days, teaching them about who God is and what God wanted to do next in their lives. Jesus changes everything. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And one day Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. He has given his spirit to his church. And Redeemer community, we have one central message that we are all about. Jesus changes everything. Oh, even now in this moment, behold the beauty of this Savior. Consider his words. Consider his deeds. Jesus changes everything. There's one beautiful word to summarize this life of Jesus. And the word is this, gospel. Gospel. The word means good news. The word means that something great has happened in world history that has everything to do with your life and mine. It means that everything can finally be changed. Things can be made whole once and for all. And there's one passage of scripture that sums it up really, really well. What happened in the life of Jesus that makes this good news? 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. And it all happened on the cross. As Jesus who lived this perfect life, as Jesus who did incredible things, something incredibly important happened at the cross. God made him who didn't have any sin and didn't know any sin to be sin, to be your sin and to be my sin and that we, so that we could become the righteousness of God. Everything that is about us is imputed to Him. Our name, our standing, our status, our reputation, our record of wrongs, and everything that is about Him now becomes ours. Oh, His name. His standing before God the Father, His sinful past which is sinless, His perfect record, all the good things that He ever said, all the good things that He ever did, now becomes ours. Not because of anything we've ever done, not because we deserve it at all, we don't. It's given to us freely. This is what we call grace. It's an act of mercy where we didn't deserve any of this and God holds back all of the punishment that we had coming and He pours it out on His undeserving Son. And in place, God gives us everything that is Jesus. 
uh, we can become the righteousness of God. This is good news. This is the gospel. And the gospel is right at the heart of everything that we're about as Redeemer Queens Park. The gospel is not the ABCs of how you get into the Christian life and then we work really hard to figure it out from there. No, the gospel is the A to Zs of the Christian life. It's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And it's the one thing that we will never stop talking about right here in the Redeemer community. Oh, this person of Jesus, everything has changed because of him. Oh, and it's a gospel to be shared. In the life of Jesus, everything it offers to be made new. Jesus was punished so that we could be forgiven. Jesus was wounded so that we could be healed. Jesus was made sin so that our sinfulness could go to Him. Oh, and His righteousness, His standing and status before God the Father comes to us. Jesus died our death that we might share in his life. Jesus became poor with our poverty so that we might become rich with his riches. Jesus bore our shame that we could share his glory. Jesus endured our rejection that we might have the acceptance of the Father. And Jesus became a curse so that we could receive the blessing. It's all about Jesus. And this news about Jesus is the gospel. And the gospel means that everything can be changed. Oh, and it's good and glorious news through the sin, through the darkness, through the confusion of your life and mine. God has loved the world, loved the world so much that he sends his son Jesus to be the Savior. This is the great news of the gospel. Jesus changes everything. And it's all about Jesus. Jesus, quite simply, is the most celebrated person in history. More songs have been written and sung to him than any other songs. More books have been written about him than any other book. More art has been commissioned to try to capture just some of his glory. More than all the other art in the history of the world. He is the most celebrated person who ever lived. And we believe he changes everything. And he changes everything through his love for us. It's out of love that God sent Jesus into the world. The Bible's most popular verse sums it up so well. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life with God. Friend, can I tell you, God loves you. This is not an abstraction we're talking about. This is not just some concept. This is a person who loves you who has acted in history to come near to you. The year was 1735, and an Anglican pastor, now missionary, named John Wesley was sailing across the Atlantic. He was headed over to the British colony of Savannah to pastor some of the people who lived there. And he would have a really tough time because when he arrived, he actually didn't have good news to share. When he arrived, he was telling people to try harder, to do better, to dig deeper, to try to be the best version of themselves. And his message didn't work because it didn't have any life in it, because it was burden for the people who heard it. He returned here to London, right in here to Aldersgate Street. And on May 24th, 1738, he says he came very reluctantly to a society meeting that was happening right here in Aldersgate Street. And something incredible happened that night. For this man, who grew up in a religious family, whose dad was a pastor in the Church of England, whose mom taught them scriptures, he knew Greek and he knew Latin. No, he was a very religious person. This man didn't know God. Jesus hadn't made all the difference in his life. And one day, everything changed. He writes in a journal entry on May 24th, 1738, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change that God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust in Christ, in Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even my sins. And he saved me from the law and from sin and from death. 
there was a moment where this religious man, he came to know Jesus personally. He came to understand that God loved him personally through the person of Jesus Christ. And that fact changed everything for him. And the country was changed through him. Schools were started, orphanages were created, training schools were formed together as people began to receive some basic life educational skills where people actually grew in their understanding of who God was and they became trained for gospel ministry. Oh, Redeemer, imagine what God could do in our own time and in our own place. Oh, in our homes, Redeemer, would God do it again? Would God raise up women and would He raise up moms that love and care for the children that have been entrusted to them? to teach them the way and the wisdom of God in our homes. No, would God do it again, Redeemer? Would He work through people who are vaguely religious and have some idea of who God might be? Would God confront people again with the fact of His love? Would God strangely warm hearts as He wakes people up from their slumber of death and brings them to life? Oh, He can do it. He can do it, Redeemer. Because the gospel isn't just good advice. The gospel is good news. The gospel doesn't make bad people good. The gospel makes dead people alive. So pick your place of death. What around us looks and feels broken? Oh, from politics to culture to thing, issues in broader society, systemic issues in school and the rest of life. Jesus changes everything. He is our only hope and oh with him everything can be changed. It's just one example from what God has done before in a little place like this in Aldersgate Street in London. And here we are, a new faith community, looking back at the things that God has done before, looking at the Lamb of God, our Savior Jesus Christ, who loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Oh, would that warm and wake up our own hearts today. So we conclude with the words of the author of Hebrews. Remember your leaders. Remember those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. And remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's us, eyes on Jesus, asking him to do it again.